Welcome to the Coding in the Wild podcast, where we explore the impact of computer science across various industries. All right. So welcome back to the next episode of the Coding in the Wild podcast. Very excited to have our guest for today, John Henry Thompson, who's been involved with computer science for a long time, built his own programming languages. So lots of cool stuff to talk about. But first, hello and welcome. Oh, yeah. It's great to be here. I really admire your platform. I'm glad you're trying to make computer science accessible to high school students. And it's really something that I'm I'm also passionate about. So I'm, I'm glad to, to support that. Awesome. Awesome. So what type of work are you doing today? I know you're doing a, you're doing a bunch of different projects. It sounds yeah, so, uh, I'm, I'm dividing my time now between I'm officially a visiting scholar at ITP at the Tisch School of the Arts. So I'm going back to what I was doing in, in the 90s, which was more teaching and create an interactive art. So I'm taking some time off from work, you know, structured time off like 50, 50 to do, you know, concentrate on that. And I, I think I said, I sent you the, my research statement. So it's, it's pretty broad, but it's, I'm interested in specifically creating, developing my dice platform, which is a real time video effects platform involving multiple devices and using that in some interactive art pieces. So that's the first part. The other part I do for work is I work at a small multimedia content development company called EP Visual Design, epvisual.com. And we create content for corporations and the government, mainly around compliance and learning, online learning. So that's it, covers it. So I just actually downloaded the Dice app. Mm-hmm. Good, okay. call. So I was playing around with it and making some, making some oh, photos. Good. So I, I guess the question has no user interface. So <laughs> well, I was trying to figure out, I guess my question is, what was the idea behind the app and how do you, how do you use it? How do you want other people to use it? Okay. Yeah, it was, it was kind of premature. I had a really big vision. I wanted to create a platform. Okay. Initially, the main use for me personally is, in, is interactive art. That's how the, if we get to talk about lingo. That's how that came about. I was using it, languages like lingo in my personal artwork. So I'm going back to that. So I was a little, little bit premature to open it up to people, but now I'm focused on making some specific interactive art projects. And then from that experience, hoping to get, and also the connection with ITP, hoping to get some students on board and some collaborators to flesh it out so it's usable by other people. Got it, got it. And say I'm you know, not super familiar with it. What do you mean when you say interactive art? Okay, so interactive art is art that involves the computer, but the computer is not the main focus. So in, in the 80s, I, I, we, I worked with Benjamin, and we, we had a project called Interactive Bed. So this was an experience. You went into a bedroom, you laid on a bed, and then depending on where you were physically on the bed, you would see one of three different video streams about this guy going through a broken up love affair. It was called uh, Long Night. So that kind of works. So, you know, it involves video, sound, and you're, you're experiencing something and the interaction is not clicking on a mouse or touching. The, the yeah, yeah. The free form. Yeah, that's one thing I like about it. And I think maybe a lot of students also don't know, like they're learning about programming or seeing what coding is and they don't know where it could apply or they have a very narrow idea of it. So I think the idea that, oh, here's how coding is, is used to make art. It sounds like you have a lot of ideas on that and have done that for a long time. So how did you get interested in that originally? So I started, my high school years were pretty much focused on math and science in learning computer programming. And then that continued about halfway through college. And then halfway through college, I went back and revisited my art making side. So I was always, always been drawing and I got, kind of got frustrated. I hit a roadblock with the, the, the computer science, left MIT, went back to art making and enrolled in Art Student League. And so just did straight ahead studio art, drawing naked people and painting <laughs> for a year. And then, but through that experience, I, I found out, this was in the 80s. I found out that at that point, there was computers were being used to, for, to make interact, to make art, you know, through slides and graphics. And I said, okay, let me focus on that. So when I went back to MIT, I joined those two things, combining art and computers. So at yeah. that point, it, it was just, now it's pretty common. Everything that's done in the art world or in any world is done digitally. Yes. In, in the 80s, that was emergent. And so I was part of that emergent process because I had early experience. But first, early experience in, in, in programming and making programming accessible and quick for myself because yeah. back in the day, Programming was a batch process. You put the pro, you put the cards or whatever off. To yeah. So what year? What year is this where you're actually doing the punch card programming? 1974. Okay. So when was the first time that you learned 
programming. Yeah, yeah, I learned it in high school, actually, in my 10th year at high school at the Bronx High School of Science. And I got to give a plug to my math teacher because the only reason I was able to get into the math lab, they called it a math lab, which was, yeah. Well. Yeah, yeah. It was only accessible to 11th graders. But I had a very forward looking middle school teacher, math teacher, Mr. Mr. Donald Cutler. And he said, it didn't make sense to teach algebra one interrupted by geometry and then algebra two. It made sense to teach algebra one and algebra two. So he had his class sign up. We, we signed up for him. He said, I'm going to teach you two years of algebra in one year. <laughs> it, was reg- it was regent space. It was a standardized test. The first year, we took ninth year algebra and took the regents in December. And then in June, we took 11th year algebra. And we all did well. We all did spectacularly well. You know? So because, of I had, because I had 11th year math, when I went into the math department and asked them to go into the math lab, they said, oh, no, you can't do it unless you have 11th year math. I said, I have it. <laughs> so I got in there at, 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 in 10th. So in 10th grade, I learned basic. Grade. What was it? What language? Basic. 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 And so basic. was this on punch cards? This was unusual at that point. We had a mainframe in the math lab. But yeah. the main work was done on a, a mini computer, an HP mini. Okay. So had one computer that was about the size of half a refrigerator with about 12 terminals hanging off of it. So you type one line at a time. Yep. It was a big advance because you could see your errors right away. Yep. That was, yep. that was a big deal back then because most yep. computer inter- Yeah, inter- that's what I think is so interesting also now. If you're a student today, you're learning on Code HS, you're learning on, you're somewhere yeah. else, like what it's like learning now versus yeah. what it was like to learn then. And so you did you did do other punch card type programming? Yeah, yeah I did. I learned basic on that timeshare machine. Okay. But they had an ancient IBM 1620. You got to... If people are interested, this okay, was, descri- describe that. I don't know. Say, I don't know what it is. What what's a, what does that mean? It's a punch card machine from the 1950s. It was about the size of three refrigerators, and that's just a computer. Then it had another thing the size of a refrigerator. That was the hard drive, which probably hold about like 10 megabytes max. And then it had a card reader, and so you, you know, you're interacted with it by. If you remember the movie, the movie that just came out, Hidden Figures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That type of computers that you see yep. there, that's the kind we had. But it was more like an archaic machine. Only a few people could operate it. But from that experience, I, I learned that you could be in high school and be employed in a computer center. There were two other students. They were juniors or seniors, and they were working at the a local hospital doing computer work. Yeah, cool. So it sounds like you, you got started, encouraged by a teacher, in math in high school, doing some basic programming, and then got more involved from there. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's kind of funny. I, I'm kind of go, looking back through my life. It was more, I would have a desire and then I would tell people about it. So I told my math teacher about it. Well, I went to the math department once I learned about it and I said I wanted to get in and they let me in. And then my geometry teacher, I told her I wanted to get a job after school because I saw these other, you know, these two other guys. And, and she got me in touch with the, the youth opportunity program that was run by the state of New York out of hospitals that got, it was to provide access to low income students, both for pay and for work experience. Yeah. So I, I got a, a job working in the computer center after school, two stops from where I lived in Harlem. I could get off at 155th Street. I lived at okay. Sugar Hill, but I had an after school job at New York Psychiatric Institute, which was two stops later. I worked there from four till eight after school. So I got paid to you know just do the batch stuff, handle the punch cards, handle the printouts. It's but I had crazy. Time I, this is like there. before. Yeah, I don't really know much about this stuff because it's before yeah. my time learning programming. But it's it's actually it's cool to to see how it's evolved. But one other thing time. I I wanted to ask you about. So it sounds like you built and designed your own programming language. Yeah. yeah. So what what was the language that you built and and how did that come about? Yeah. So Lingo came about. It goes back to kind of high school. My, I did my first language in high school. I built an interpreter for that mainframe. Basic was only available on a timeshare computer. So I thought it was an interesting problem. And I was curious about how languages work. So yeah. I was a basic interpreter in high school. And then in college, I got exposed to Lisp, yep. which was revolutionary in that time because it was a dynamic language. Yep. The things that you take for granted now in JavaScript, that was industry changing back then. So yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. AI and all this new rapid development was, was coming out of that approach to programming. So when I went to MIT and I, got, I saw a Lisp, I said, this is great. I love this. This is, you know, it was a total paradigm shift for me. So I built a, a Lisp interpreter in college. And then as I got more involved in interactive in art, art making and digital art construction, I saw there was an opportunity to, it made my life easier when I, in experimenting yeah. with 
interactive art. So Lingo came out of some interactive artwork I did. I built a, a Lisp-like interpreter for my interactive art. And then when I was working at Macromedia and they had this animation system, they had a rudimentary basic interpreter that it actually got out of Dr. Dobbs' journal. It was a journal back in the, in the 70s for, for hobbyists. So I saw an opportunity to replace it with a more sophisticated interpreter, you know, one that was built, built on Lisp principles, so dynamic types and recursion and all that kind of stuff. So, so that's how it came about. It, it, it evolved from the work I was doing earlier. And then yeah. uh, Macromedia, I saw an opportunity to plug it in. What was the main use case? Was the main use case building those types of animations or was it something else? It was making scripting easy enough that I could, you know, it was easy for me to do it. I didn't have to recompile a program to see some effect change. And then what was coming out in the 80s was the introduction of digital editing tools for content. It first evolved in using it for video games. That's where Macromedia came out of. So uh, Mark Tanner saw that he was heavily into the, the, the gaming industry. He saw there was an opportunity to make digital easier for the masses, not just the specialist, not yeah. just the video game specialist, but artists in general. So that's how Macromedia Director came about and kind of pushed, it helped push the multimedia revolution of the 90s where PCs w- went from spreadsheets to entertainment engines, you know, with sound and graphics and all that. Yeah. And so Macromedia yeah. helped people, creative professionals that weren't used to creating content on the computer created on the computer. So part of that, you know, so when you're dealing with the computer, you have to, you have the graphics, but then you have to deal with interaction without having to go to a programmer. Now you had these languages like lingo and back in the eighties, it was hypercard, which yeah. was to be a, a easy to use card based language. And that, that kind of inspired the, the syntax for, for lingo. So that, that's kind of the, the, the yeah. wow. how was that as a project, like building a programming language? How did it that? Great. It was great fun. But I said the, the, the programming wasn't so much interesting as you know, because I've done it before. What was interesting was making it accessible to people. How do you make that, it easy to use for that yes, particular exactly. use case? Yeah. So yeah. let's maybe jump forward to today. So, you know, you were building languages to make it a little bit easier. Now there's even way more tools. They're way easier to use. So what sorts of tools, languages are you excited about? Or what are you using in terms of making interactive art today or you know something anything related that you're exploring yeah, yeah, yeah. dice is, is dice is based is an ios app so it's mainly based in objective c with uh, javascript mixed in for the user interface okay. javascript is an html is a cross-platform way to get user interfaces up professionally we're settling in on node.js and javascript that whole you know stack you know it can work in the browser it can work on the server so that's where we're settled the kind of work that we do ironically though it's actually a lot because it's so fragmented, it's harder for people to get in. And that's why I appreciate Code A, Code HS. Yeah, that's yeah, that's one thing we're trying to do. I mean, make it easier to get started and put all the resources in one spot. And I think, yeah, it's it's come a long way from, you know, maybe what it was like for you learning it in high school. And and right now, hopefully the idea is a teacher can get started in just a few minutes. And yeah. you know, that's what we're that's what we're working towards. So what do you see as like the future of the digital art, interactive art, you know, what, like, what kind of projects are you working on today that you're excited about? Or do you see it going in the next, you know, few years since you've been uh, working on projects like this for a while? Yeah, it's kind of a constant kind of dilemma because what people are most interested, you know, the everyday people are most interested in is things that are prepackaged. You know, okay. so like games and which have a high production cost. Yes. I'm interested in things that you can build yourself. So that's why I'm, I'm really excited about getting back to ITP because their focus is what can you build new kind of interactions. Yeah. So know, what's the idea? So yeah, what's the idea behind this program, the ITP program? It's about exploration, making computers more accessible. And, and a lot of the movement in, in the industry is to displace people. You say, you know, mm. you know, the mm. big economy. And all yeah, that. right, so right. There's a, there's a big economic drive to mm-hmm. do but what it's trying to do is give a voice to the creative people to express themselves using this powerful tools there. Yeah. You know, Arduino's the one dollar, you get a you know chip this big that can do sensors and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. You know, like something like with with dice, I'm hoping to I have dozens of these little devices. I'd like to do something interesting with them, you know, network them together. And once I make it easy for me to do it, you know, hopefully make it easier for others. So I think that the thrust is to make it easier for people to be creative with these tools yeah. rather than just 
what's generally available, which is good. I don't, I don't, I like to go see a nice shiny movie. Yeah. Um, I also like to make something, you know, make things. And I, I, like, yeah, no, I like the idea of saying, how do you make the technology human centered? How do you make it creative? Not putting the technology and the art in silos. I think that's really cool. And, and also um, like a multidisciplinary approach. Cause I find that I got the most excitement out of combining the art with the technology. So I like to be able to collaborate with people that have interest in, and strengths in, in other fields. Yeah. Yeah. We're, Almost out of time, probably. So I want to ask a couple other questions. So what's something that you would want to share with teachers or students who might be learning programming now, maybe some who are interested in, you know, using it in the future, some who are maybe, you know, feel it's really challenging, but are, you know, just exploring it for the first time. What's something you'd want to share with them about coding, computer science, something you've learned or something surprising? I would encourage them to reflect on their passions, no matter what it is, because the computer is touching anything, everything, the arts, sports, business. So the right introduction to computers doesn't have to be frustrating. If an introduction course seems frustrating, it's the wrong introductory course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so be perseverant. Look, if you're interested in learn, and it's a fascinating topic and you know it has a lot of benefits. So find the right introductory class. And see where it meshes with your passion, you know. Yeah, I like you that. Sports and all, or, or, or what? Yeah. There's no reason to limit yourself, you know. Yeah, that's good. There's, there's, there's kind of a push now to say this is a necessary skill. This is a literary skill. It's a fun skill to have, you know. Yeah, I think it can be both. It can be both. <laughs> yeah, it's both. yeah it, it's, but yeah, it's, it's not either or. But yeah, yeah, I don't think it's either or. I like the idea of, again, connecting it to their interests or yeah. whatever those interests are, whether it's like you know, what you're saying in the arts or wherever, you know, whatever connections people have. If someone wants to check out your work online, is there a best place for them to find your... JohnHenryThompson.com pretty okay. much has, it has a repository. It's not, maybe not well organized, but everything is there. You'd be searching. It's all there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I saw that site. It's awesome. Cool. Well, thank you again for being on the podcast. and. Good luck with all of the projects and I will look forward to checking out the new interactive art that you're working on. Thank you for having me on. Okay, that's a wrap. Join us for our next episode on Coding in the Wild brought to you by CodeHS.